The words of the police chief offered little consolation to the families of the victims in the mass murders. The chief did say his department and other law enforcement agencies are continuing their investigation. There will be more digging for graves and there will be more grief as additional victims are identified. George Lewis, NBC News, Houston. Hey YouTube family, welcome back. It is your girl Sade and welcome to Sade's Mix. If you're new here on Sundays, I talk about a true crime story, my life here in South Florida and its beautiful hidden gems. And if any of that interests you, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And if you, of course, enjoy this video, you guys can go ahead and give me a thumbs up or whatever. I appreciate it either way. Today, I thought I would do like a spooky true crime story with you guys. So we are going to talk about the story of the Candyman. Just a quick warning, yeah, viewer discretion is absolutely advised. There's going to be a lot of talk about assault, murder, child abuse. So if any of that is a trigger, I totally 100% understand and it's okay. There'll be other less gruesome videos. Um, but yeah, let's talk about the Candyman, and not this Candyman that everyone knows and most likely loves, but we're going to talk about this one, Dean Coral and his disgusting habits. So Dean here was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana on December 24th of 1939, making him a Capricorn, which not a good look for you guys because this story is horrendous. But yeah, hopefully you guys can redeem yourself in another story, but this is not the one. Dean was born to Arnold and Mary Coral, and it was said that Dean's mother, Mary, was really overprotective of her son, like really coddled him a lot, and his father was the total opposite. He was strict on him, he was very hard on Dean, he just wanted him to succeed. The couple, Arnold and Mary, they seemed to have a very unhappy relationship and they actually would get divorced when Dean was about 7 years old. After the divorce, Mary, the mom, she would go on to sell the family home and move into a trailer in Memphis, Tennessee. The reason for this isn't really too clear because I don't understand, but it was said that she moved into this trailer home to be closer to Arnold because Arnold had just been enlisted in the Air Force, but it seemed like they didn't have a great relationship, so I'm assuming that the only reason why she moved was so that the father could be in the kids' lives. I really, it didn't make any sense of why they even separated. As a kid, Dean was described to be a shy but serious kid and he really didn't have any friends. And when Dean was 7 years old, he actually developed rheumatic fever. For you guys out there who don't know what rheumatic fever is, because I absolutely didn't know, it is an infectious disease that you can develop or is developed from untreated strep throat and it can affect your heart, your joints, your brains, pretty much everything throughout your body. But he wasn't officially diagnosed with rheumatic fever until he was 11. It wasn't life-threatening, but it prevented him from playing in any of the sports activity. This reminds me of John Wayne Gacy. If you guys don't know about him, please look him up. He's a killer clown. And there's so many similarities between John Wayne Gacy and Dean Coral's story that, you know, maybe one day I'll cover his crazy ass, but... Yeah, it's so creepy how their lives are very parallel. But anyway, back to Dean's crazy ass. Following the second divorce, Mary, she would go on to marry a man by the name of Jack West, and he was a traveling clock salesman, which is so funny. Like, it's just so crazy thinking about the jobs that people had back in the 70s and 80s. He was a traveling clock salesman. Like, who the hell was doing that? But yeah, she got with Jack West, they got married, and the family relocated to Vidora, Texas. After relocating to Texas, Mary and Jack decided that they wanted to start their own business. And they decided they were going to open up a candy shop from right inside of their garage. And that's exactly what Mary and Jack did. They started to make candy and sell it right from their garage, and they named their company Pecan Prints. Now Dean, he was there all the time and he played a huge role for the candy company. Dean and his younger brother Stefan, who I failed to mention because he's really not important for the story, um, the two of them, they actually operated the machinery that made the candy. So they would experiment, they would make their own candy, but they made sure the business was up and running by maintaining the machines. 
Now, Dean would do this throughout all of his schooling, all of his high school years. So if he wasn't at school, you would find him at the candy shop. Like that was his home away from home. And but then in 1960, at the age of 21, Dean was asked by his mother if he would return back to Indiana to take care of his widowed grandmother. Dean wasn't there for too long. He was there for about four years and then he would actually return back to Texas. I have no idea what happened to the grandmother. I assume maybe she passed on, but yeah, after four years, he was back in Texas and he was ready to start his new business adventure. Dean, like his mother, wanted to start his own candy business. However, before he can start his new business adventure, Dean was drafted into the U.S. Army in 1964. Oh, but Dean wasn't staying for too long. After 10 months of serving, he was able to successfully apply for a hardship discharge which I did not know that was a thing, but basically he informed the U.S. Army that he was the brains of the company and that he needed to stay behind and support his mother through her business adventures. Honestly, the 70s was a different ass time because that would not be something that they would stand for nowadays. At least I don't think. So once that was approved, he was honorably discharged and Dean went back to work at his family's candy shop. Now, nobody suspected that Dean was doing anything wrong, but Dean, he was not an honorable employee. You see, Dean liked the candy shop and liked the attention that he was getting from the candy shop because Dean here, he liked the little boys and he liked to lure the little boys into the candy shop. You know that he was trying to do some funny-ish to him and naturally, you know, you're thinking that the mom probably said something to Dean or tried to protect him since she was overprotective. Yeah, she did protect him. She fired the employee instead of reprimanding her son for making a move on a 13 year old boy. She decides that she was going to fire the employee versus saying anything to her son. The candy shop attracted a lot of teenage boys. Some of them worked there. Most of them were customers, but a good portion of the kids that were hanging around the candy shop were either troubled teens or runaway youth. And Dean quickly built a relationship with these kids. To basically keep the kids around, Dean made like an employee lounge in the back of the candy shop where he would put a pool table and allow the employees to bring their friends over. It was like a safe space for them to drink and have fun, but it was really just Dean's hunting ground. And naturally, you know, these kids would hang around there all the time and Dean would try to test the waters with whoever he thought would be accepting of his advances. Now, eventually, Dean was able to get really close to one kid in particular. In 1967, Dean would meet 12-year-old David Brooks. David would go on several interviews and state that at first he saw Dean as a father figure because his father in his life wasn't around and Dean would always be there with money and gifts. So he really looked up to Dean at first. But that fatherly friendship started to quickly change. And within two years, Dean was bribing David with gifts and money to not only get David to perform sexual acts upon him, but for David to keep his silence. Between the September of 1970 and August of 1973, Dean would actually go on to commit 28 murders of young boys. In September of 1970, Dean would claim his first victim. It was an 18-year-old student and he was hitchhiking from Houston, Texas to Austin, Texas. His body wasn't discovered until three years later and he was a victim of sexual assault and horrendous torture. Just a few months later in December, Dean would go on to kidnap two more boys. He would bring them back to his home where he would sexually assault them, torture them, beat them, you name it, he was doing it to them. But this time, something would actually happen. 
Now get this, while Dean has these poor young boys in his house and he has them tied up, he is abusing them, all that stuff, David unexpectedly pops up at Dean's house and walks in on the crime being committed. And now I know what you're thinking, you're probably thinking like, the jig is up, David's gonna say something, but Dean was quick on his feet. So Dean having to think quickly, he tells David that he's part of this like pornography slavery ring and that these boys are just participants. And then once he's done with them, he's going to ship them to California. And David, for the most part, believes Dean because why would he not believe him? One, first off, he is a victim himself and he's been groomed by Dean, but he's never been harmed, harmed, harmed by Dean so why would he not trust him but eventually the truth does come out and Dean does tell David that yeah there's no there's no pornography ring I raped and tortured these young boys and I killed them and Dean knows that you know David he's young he's 15 years old and he's been bribing him this whole time why not keep this going so Dean bribes David yet again he buys him a brand new Corvette and he tells him if you bring me young boys to the house, I will pay you $200 for these young men. And it was hard to see if David agreed immediately or if it was some time, but David does eventually agree to help him lure men into his apartment. Now David is bringing in these young boys. Many of them become victims um, to Dean's whatever the hell he's doing. And most of these boys were actually David's friends. And there was one boy in particular that David brought over to Dean to be his next victim that Dean actually grew to like. And this young man's name was Elmer Henry and he would meet Dean in the winter of 1971. Dean thought that Elmer was a good fit for the crimes that they were committing and he even offered Elmer the exact same incentive that he offered David, $200 for every boy that he lures into his apartment. He even told Elmer the exact same thing that he told David, that this was part of a pornography ring and that he was just selling these boys into slavery. Elmer would say for months he ignored Dean's offer. But eventually, Elmer does decide to take Dean on his offer because at that time, $200 was a lot of money. and. His family was not as stable as they would like to be and they were struggling to just get by day by day. So Elmer just thought if he would just do this for a little bit of time, he would be helping out his family in the long run. Eventually, just like David, Elmer finds out the truth about this pornography ring and despite knowing what Dean was doing and not always getting fully paid for him luring the boys to his house, Elmer continued to help Dean and was actively participating in the abductions and the murders. In the numerous interviews I've watched with just David, it is clear that David was under the impression that Elmer enjoyed killing these young boys. The majority of Dean's victims were abducted from Houston Heights, which is a area within downtown Houston. This area was known to be a low income family area, so there were easy pickings, especially since they were kids who needed a job, who needed a place, who needed stability. Dean was right there to scoop these young boys up. The trio, they would abduct their victims in two different ways. They would ask them if they wanted a ride and take them anywhere that they need to. And, you know, at that time, Dean had like a Plymouth GTX, you know, one of those little fancy, fancy cars. So he would use that to show off to the boys and get them to come into his car. And then the other option was like, he would just tell them like, hey, I got booze, I got drugs. Um, you guys want to come over and have a good time? And once the kids said sure you know they would head back to dean's house party get wasted and that's where the torture or the nightmare would be from what i've already said about dean as you can tell this man was a sickle but dean he really did some crazy stuff in some cases 
Dean would force his victims to like call home or write postcards to his to their families explaining like why they're not home yet or why they can't return. Most of the kids would tell their parents like oh we just left so that we can bring some money home for you guys or we just we're just leaving because this guy offered me five dollars to work for him every day and because the kids were calling home and calling their parents and making up all these excuses the police were not looking for the boys they actually were saying that because these kids were runaways or troubled teens and being a runaway wasn't illegal in 1970 that there was no reason to go look for these boys which that's less than 40 years ago do you guys not know that like less than 40 years ago running running away was not a concern for people just you could just run away like, so all of these kids are going missing and the police are just like well they're runaways nothing we can do about it if they come back we'll ask them but these victims weren't coming back and the community was so frustrated with all of their sons their babies going missing so once the victim was deceased, they proceeded to then wrap the body up and then dump them at four various locations in the Houston area. The first one was the Boulevard Peninsula. The second one was a boat shed that Dean had owned himself. The third one was a wooded area near Lake Sam Rayborn. And then the fourth one was a beach in Jefferson County. As I mentioned, this would go on for three years of Dean and David and Elmer Lauren boys torturing them, committing these disgusting crimes. But finally, after three years, this madness would come to an abrupt end. On August 8th of 1973, Elmer actually lured two teenagers to Dean's house. Their names were Timothy and Rhonda. Now, Dean... Dean, 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 he was pissed off. You brought a girl to my torture pad? I don't even like girls. Dean did calm down. He provided the teens with alcohol, with marijuana, and Elmer and Timothy wound up sniffing paint fumes, which y'all remember when sniffing glue was like a thing and people would eat it and sniff it? Do people still do that? If you do, please don't do that. It's very harmful. Um, and it's dangerous but do you guys remember when that was like the oh my god make sure you don't buy too much glue for your kids I remember. okay so back to the story so elmer when he wakes up he realizes that his ankles were bound and that there was tape on his mouth and at that exact same moment dean was actually handcuffing him and he looks over elmer and he realizes that both timothy and Rhonda are laying next to him and they're also um gagged and tied up timothy though is completely naked so it is not looking good for the situation and at this point dean is screaming he's upset that Rhonda is in the house and he is now telling elmer that he is going to kill them all elmer's thinking quickly like i don't want to die and i gotta figure something out so he convinces dean to basically untie him so that he can help dean kill the kids or kill his friends and Dean at first was reluctant to untie him but he does and he tells Elmer that he wants to separate the two so to bring Rhonda into one room and he's going to take Timothy into his torture room. Now I failed to mention this Dean did have his gun at the time and was using it to intimidate the trio but once he started to assault Timothy, he had to put the gun down and Elmer saw this as his opportunity to escape. He quickly grabs the weapon and he tells Dean that he is tired of this and it has got to end, that he has killed enough of his friends and then he was not going to allow this to continue anymore. When Dean realizes that Elmer has a gun pointed at him, he laughs and he tells Elmer that you're not going to shoot me, you're not going to do anything, and you're going to be just like one of my other victims. But to everyone's surprise, Elmer does fire his gun and the first bullet hits Dean right in the forehead, but it doesn't break his skull. So Dean is still up and coherent and he lunges towards Elmer to attack him and then Dean puts 
five more bullets in him, ceasing his existence. And the reign of the candy man is no more. At 8.24 a.m., Elmer quickly calls the police and confesses to everything that we discussed today. Um, on August 9th, David actually shows up to the police station as well, but he only confessed to being involved in one murder and being aware of two of the rapes that had happened to two of the younger boys in the beginning. Um, but he doesn't admit to being active in any of the murders or any of the participation. But Elmer, 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 Elmer would tell the total opposite and state that David was involved in at least all but three of the crimes. With the help of the two boys, the police were able to locate the dumping grounds that Dean had and they were able to locate 28 victims by 1983. So that means 10 years after Dean had passed, they had finally found all of his victims. With the help of um, David and Elmer, the police was able to find the four locations that Dean used as his dumping grounds. And the police were able to find all 28 victims by 1983, 10 years after Dean had passed. And there is still one victim that is unidentified to this day. On July 1st of 1964, just a little over a year after the crimes had taken place, um, Elmer was convicted of six murders. There was a buttload of evidence and it only took 92 minutes for the jurors to deliberate. Um, on July 16th, Elmer was found guilty and sentenced to six life consecutive sentences, which would total him for 504 years in prison. So death, death by prison. That's what it should say, death by prison. David's trial was on February 14th of 1974, and he was only charged with one murder, even though he was said to have committed four or more. Long story short, it, it also just took the jury 92 minutes to decide and he was convicted and given a life sentence as well without the chance of parole. Now, here's an update on the story. Elmer's ass is still alive. He still remains in the news. He created a Facebook page to promote his artwork. He has given a lot of controversy interviews about how he feels and what he would say to Dean at this point. Um, he also would like to not be classified as a serial killer, although he is classified as a serial killer for have killed six or more boys. You're a serial killer. David, unfortunately, he passed away in May uh, of 2020. He actually died of COVID complications he contracted while in prison. And as for Dean, really, there's not much to be said about who this man is and the people who did know Dean are so confused and taken back to how he could be like this but yeah that's the story of the candy man my personal opinion I, I don't even know if I have any personal opinion this story is so horrendous and these young boys David and Elmer were of course victims but they had the opportunity to say and turn his ass in and they didn't. I am a firm believer when it comes to Elmer that he actually enjoyed what he was doing. And if you guys are interested, I will leave a couple of his interviews in the description box down below so you guys can see what kind of person he is because he shows no remorse. He also has an IQ of like 129, so he's pretty smart. Um, but it just is like, damn, 28 boys? <sighs> and no one did anything because being a runaway was legal at the time. Good job. This could have all have been ended had his mother had done something when the very first boy said that he was trying to make a move on him. Like, I don't I wasn't able to figure out like what happened to his mother and his father were they alive when these acts were committed were they alive when he was dead it was really really hard to find any of those details but yeah that's it guys that's all I have for you guys today I hope you guys enjoyed this video if you've made it to the end you are my new best friend thank you so much um I will have more videos coming up 
soon. Life has been really hectic. If you guys care to stay around and hear me ramble, but life has been really hectic. Um, just want to give you guys a heads up. I'm starting a new career path, if I've mentioned, and I'm like halfway through getting all that stuff together. So sorry for not being as consistent on YouTube as I want, but that's all going to change really soon. But I love and appreciate you guys. Be safe out there. Do something that is gonna make you smile today i guess and what can we take away from this yeah just if you have a gut feeling go with it because i feel like a lot of these boys knew that what was happening was wrong and they just didn't listen but yeah anyway guys i love you and appreciate you guys so much have a wonderful sunday happy halloween i guess i should just oh, that's it. Happy Halloween, everybody. Um, be safe out there. Wear your mask, and I will be seeing you in my next video.